And I know that we've really been hitting how marvelous it is to pray in the Holy Spirit, and it still is, still is. But you know, the prayer of agreement is super important. And I said to my kids, I've never taught on the prayer of agreement like I should. And I thought, you know, we could remedy that. And besides that, I also knew there's, there's, we'll get there in a minute, go ahead. Now I exhort you, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul is talking to the Corinthian church and said, if you've got any divisions, heal them up, because healing and wholeness and unity is where the power is. It's so vitally important to the Lord that we all agree, because agreement is massively powerful. Would you say that with me? Agreement is massively powerful. Now, before we go to the power, Tower of Babylon, I also want to point out that division is massively destructive. Matthew 12, 25, and we'll just read on the screen, Jesus said this. He said, in knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. And we know this in a marriage, a family, a home, a church. But what the Lord spoke to me a couple weeks ago, he says, it isn't, the problem is not that you don't have unity in the church. You just haven't made full use of the power of that unity in prayer. We can get anything in the world we need by through agreement in prayer. And it's not even hard. One of the things I love when I teach on authority is people call me up. They literally say this. They say, you taught us everything except how easy it is. Isn't that true? Didn't you get Izzy's healing without ever, you, you know, this guy got, they uprooted their whole lives to come to the mainland from Guam to get healing for, or to get a help, medical help for their daughter. And you prayed and got the healings and it surprised you because it was easier. I love that story because you see, really and truly, there is nothing that should be hard in prayer. Okay? Well, that's true. Um, you're going to see it tonight. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, in a kingdom. We can't afford division. Because division inevitably results in destruction. Unity results in strength. Now, uh, maybe I should have had you go to Matthew 18, 19. It's up to you, and then we're going to go to Genesis. Matthew 18, 19 is our text for tonight. I know you know it, but we're going to look at it and hopefully see it on a deeper level. Read it with me. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. I don't just grab somebody on the sidewalk in Colonial Beach and have them agree with me in prayer. Okay? When you look for an agreer, this is really important. And there's a lot of things I want to say tonight. Maybe some of them are obvious. I don't ask people to agree with me on everything I ever pray for. 95% of what I pray for is not hard to get. I mean, what, you know, well-being for my kids today, provision, all the stuff you need, it's, it's, it's like a no-brainer. But once in a while, you will meet resistance in the spirit, and you can feel it when you're praying. That's when you look for somebody to agree with you, okay? So I'm not, in my excitement over the prayer of agreement, I'm not saying get somebody to agree. You don't need somebody. You've got a good line of communication with God. But when you come up against something where there is resistance in the spirit, it really, really helps to find a good agreer. When you look for an agreer, there's got to be agreement at two points. First of all, this has to be somebody you get along with. If you, <laughs> if you have ever fought with your spouse and fought hard and then needed prayer agreement best, you better repent before you pray because there is zero power in a fighting couple, okay?
okay, uh, maybe y'all look so innocent, I'm sure you've never been there, that I have been there, I have been there where we walked into a service and we've been fighting and the anointing on that service was non-existent. I'm not proud of it. We were green. We were dumb. We didn't know you couldn't fight and go into a service and have a good service. Well, we learned fast. I told you, this sounds funny, but it's the truth. We decided that we, 20 minutes before service, we had to get in unity. Then we made it Saturday night, and we finally got all the way back to Thursday night. By Thursday night, there were going to be no more fights. And then one day, it occurred to our lightning-fast mind that maybe we could eliminate fights. That was a radical, <laughs> radical thought. No more fights. And you know what? It's possible, and there's heaven on earth. And you say, you're being silly. I'm not being silly. If you want to agree with somebody in prayer, you need two things. Number one, they have to like you. You have to like them. Right. You say, yeah, smile and say, I like you and have animosity on the inside. On. That person needs to have fervent goodwill toward you and you need to have fervent goodwill toward them. That's unity. Got it? The second thing that they have to have is an agreement that the word of God means what it says. And when you come and you say, do you believe that by his stripes I am healed, that he really meant that? Or whatever it is, could be in whatever finances, whatever you need. Do you agree that the covenant of God, now you don't have to test them, you know in your heart, but those are, those are the two tests. Do they have fervent good will toward you and you toward them? And do they agree that what God has said, he will always perform that covenant? And then there is a third one that I didn't put into the conditions as I was studying. But when you come into agreement, if I come into agreement with Nathan on something, that means any time the thought comes to me, oh, God's never going to do that, I have to be willing to say he most certainly will do it. I am in agreement that that's the way it's going to be and no other. You've got to have somebody that cares enough about you to take a stand in faith. Does that make sense? Amen. We probably go over this again. It's really a precious thing because when you get two people who have decided on earth, this is the way it will be according to the will of God and no other, and they won't get out of that agreement, it has to happen. All right, if two of you on earth, okay, can't agree with somebody that's gone on to heaven, when you say you're being silly, now I want you to understand, do you know why you have authority? You have authority because of your earth suit. The minute you die, you lose authority on this planet. Human beings living on this earth have authority. God gave it to them when he's, we'll read a little bit in Genesis 1. And when two people on earth come into agreement that that's the way it will be according to the will of God, and you can't get them out of that agreement, it will be that way. Again, I say to you, if any two of you on earth agree about what anything they ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Now let's look at Genesis 11, 1. As you see the power of agreement here so perfectly. Now the whole earth <coughs> used the same language and the same words. Quick question. Were they in perfect agreement about what each word meant? Yeah, complete agreement, verse 2. And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used bricks for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into the heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, We'll be, we will be scattered abroad over the whole face of the earth. Now, the interesting thing is if you just read this on a superficial level, it doesn't look that wicked, does it? The trouble was that three, of, three out of their five purposes were totally against the will of God and the purpose of God. The plan of God was to get a redeemer in, to get a way to heaven. Now, did you happen to make that sheet of five purposes, Stephen? Okay, they, there's five in that verse. You can look at it right in your own Bible. They said, let's make bricks. Let's build a city. I don't think God had trouble with either of those. Let's build a tower up to heaven. Let's make a different way to heaven than the one the Lord will provide. Let's make themselves a name. We don't live for our own glory. If we live for our own glory, we are idolaters. If I live for my name, I'm an idolater. Yeah. If I live from the name of Jesus, I'm a worshiper. Hallelujah. All right? They said, let's build a tower to heaven, provide a different way to heaven. Let's make ourselves a name, and let's not be scattered and say, what's wrong with that? Look at Genesis 9, 7, just two chapters earlier. The Lord has spoken to, eight, or to Noah when he got off the ark, and he said, as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. He didn't say cold populate this one plain of Shinar. He said, populate the earth. So in saying, we're going to stay right here and 
hunker down and build ourselves when they were coming against the purposes of God. Amen? And you say, well, what's so big about that? Like I say, all of the purposes of God, Genesis to Malachi, were to get Jesus into the earth. So, how serious was the threat to the plan? It just doesn't look that big, does it? Well, good, your men are going to put some order together. Let's look how serious the threat was. Verse 5. <coughs> the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. We don't see this as a, as a serious threat to the plan of God that a bunch of people are going to make a tower that he said because they all speak the same language, they're saying the same thing, let's do these five purposes, it's going to counteract my plan unless I stop it. Now, you have to admit, he was pretty gentle. He could have sent an atomic bomb or a cyclone, but he just kept them from saying the same thing. Now understand, if the devil can keep you and the person you love and have come into agreement from saying the same thing. He's just stopped you. The, there's a lot of secrets in tonight's lesson. You know why it's so powerful to say, by his stripes I am healed? Because you're in agreement with heaven. You know how it's so powerful to say, I am the dumbest thing that ever lived? Because you're in agreement with darkness. I hope nobody says that, but I'm tempted to sometimes. You ever been tempted to curse yourself unknowingly? All right. You've got to get out of agreement with the devil and into agreement with God. When they use their authority and purposes cross for purposes crosswise to the plan and purposes of God, he had no choice but to intervene, and the way he intervened was to disrupt their language. Verse 7, come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. <coughs> wow. I want to read you this. When... He disrupted their perfect agreement that came against their plan. He disrupted the plan. When Jesus Christ taught us to pray, he taught us to pray in perfect agreement with the Lord's plan. What did, what did he say? The, the disciples said, teach us to pray. The way John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray, he said, pray them in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Calm your kingdom. Be done your will on earth as it is in heaven. Look at Matthew 6.10. I know you know this because I've taught it a lot of you, but it's new to some people and they need to know it. This is the this verse of the Lord's Prayer will change your life if you pray it every day. Because the word, when it says your kingdom come, in the Greek it's actually command. Come, righteousness and peace and joy to my life today. Be done, your highest exact will in my life today, even as it is done in heaven. What that means is, whatever you're saying in heaven, I'm saying on earth. We're going to get into the same exact... Okay, are you following here? Yeah. When these people said the same thing, the Lord said, we got to stop them because they're not stopped unless they, if they keep saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Whatever you are saying in heaven, Jesus, I want to say here on earth. If you say, by his stripes I'm healed, I'm going to say nothing but by your stripes I'm healed. If you say, I'm going to supply your needs according to my riches, I'm going to look at my bank account and say, I don't care... He will supply my needs according to your riches. If I say your will be done in this earth as perfectly as your will is done in heaven, I am in perfect agreement with what heaven says. Amen? Amen. Now, 1 John 5. Let's just go here. I guess we're about done with Genesis. 1 John 5, 14. We're looking at agreement from a couple of different angles, but I think it's really important to understand for one thing, we're going to see that the Lord said every fact is established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. You say, what difference does that make? It's terribly important. If, if I'm up here teaching you and you're starting to get it, and I bring in a special speaker that preaches crosswise, do you know what? You just got confused. But if I bring in a special speaker who says the word of God is a holy covenant that God will stand by every time, he's saying amen to this covenant. Are you following him? Every, it's so important that the voices that speak into your children's lives are unified and clear and consistent. Amen? Okay. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. I just want to make a point here. We're talking about agreement on earth between two people. But if you will just find something that's written in here and he's already said it, you don't even need agreement. You're putting yourself in agreement with God. 
You say, well, when would I need agreement on earth? Well, there's nothing in the Bible that says that New Life Ministries will have all the land the soccer fields are on. But we need it, and it's the will of God. So in that case, I am looking for people who will come into agreement with me. Right. And this is not going to hurt anybody. The, the person who wanted to build a shopping center there 14 years ago, it hasn't happened. It's probably not going to happen now that we already have two shopping centers. It's supposed to be a shopping center. He's been really, really good to us. He came to me one day about three years ago and he says, would you like to shop, park on my shopping center? I said, I sure would. <laughs> he said, I hear your ma the, the church is maxing the place out. And I said, we really are. He said, well, even when I build my shopping center, which was the plant there, we won't be needing on a Sunday morning. Just go and plant. You know that? And then I called him up and said, besides parking, could we play soccer? And he says, why not? You know? But now we're going to need that. Now, here's my point. If you, you don't need anybody on earth to agree with you that Jesus Christ came to give you life and life abundantly. It's written in, in so, much, so many words. Yeah. So you get up in the morning and you just put yourself in agreement. Father, I thank you that you came. Jesus came that I could have abundant life. I thank you that today I will enjoy life abundantly. I don't need you to agree with me on that. I've got it written. Yeah. But when it comes to the parking lot becoming our <laughs> next Hallelujah. building, because we don't have a place to build a building, then you and I have to come into agreement on earth and say, Father, we ask you that you would touch the owner's heart to sell us the land so that we can expand and fulfill the purposes of God. Are you following me? There we have to come into agreement with each other. Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at verse 15. We know that if he hears us in whatever we ask, let's go back. We better read 14 again. This is the confidence which we have before. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. His will on 90% of your life is right here. It's your will that you have peaceful days. It's your will, his will that you enjoy angelic protection. 90% of everything you need is written, okay? This is the confidence which we ask, have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have the request. It is a no-brainer to get what is written clearly in here from God. All you have to do, but, okay, are you following here? Sometimes you have to get into agreement with the person. That's why 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, uh, Paul writes to that church and he says, I exhort you, no bickering, no divisions. Right? Why? You're, now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you. I'm not saying that there are divisions in church. I'm just saying that's why it's so important. And if you really want to be a powerhouse couple in Christianity... You just really got to get striped down to a minimum or nothing. Mm -hmm. And that can be done. Amen? Amen? That there be no divisions among you, but that you be complete in the same mind and the same judgment. Hallelujah. Now, think about this. A covenant is powerful because it is a permanent form of agreement. When I perform the wedding in a little while, I don't think they're here tonight, but when I perform that wedding and they come into a marriage covenant, they are permanently agreeing to be faithful to each other. Amen. All right? It's binding even beyond death. Look at 1 Samuel 20. Uh, Jonathan was in the in unusual position of being the heir apparent, and yet he knew that David had been anointed to be the next king. The beautiful thing about Jonathan was he didn't get mad about it, and he didn't hate David. He said, let's be friends. This is, this is a smart dude. He knew that... He loved him like he loved himself. He knew David was going to be the next, next king because Samuel had anointed him. The whole nation knew. Okay? Some people tried to fight God. They stuck with Saul. First Samuel 20, they've just made a covenant. And Jonathan is speaking here. He said, if I am still alive, will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die? Now, why would he say that? Well, if a new king and a new monarchy came on the scene, they killed the old king and all his sons. Everywhere. That was standard procedure. You said that there wouldn't be a revolt to put the old monarchy back, right? Jonathan said, will you not show me loving kindness? And then verse 15 says, you shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, may the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. Jonathan made David bow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. And then skip to verse 23. As for the agreement of which you and I have spoken, Jonathan says, the Lord is between you and me forever. This was a covenant so holy that when Jonathan did die prematurely, you know, Saul and his sons died there on Mount Goboa, 
David honored Jonathan's offspring, if you remember. He found Mephibosheth and blessed him. And he said, what is this all about? I'm talking about agreement with people that is so powerful, you couldn't not stay in agreement with them because you love them. That is the kind of, of prayer of agreement that is really easy to get answered between heaven and earth. Does that make sense? Hallelujah. Two people agreeing on something has power also to establish, I'm not sure I explained that, the covenant. The reason you and your wife have so much covenant is because you have promised to be faithful to each other as long as you're both alive. That's holy. It is, it, it, is, it is just so honored by God. And you say, why is it holy? Well, let me tell you something. His word here, which he has promised to you, is holy. The reason you can walk in this sin-ridden, dangerous place is because, without any fear is because you serve a father who is faithful to his covenant, right? He is in total agreement that every article of this covenant, that means every verse of scripture, will be performed in your life if you'll just believe it and agree with it. I've, stuff, I've seen stuff about the agreement all day today. That I mean, it's so easy to get our prayers answered because God is honest. You just have to agree with him. And then when you need something that, on earth, that is on earth that isn't specifically written, you find somebody to agree with and say, this is how I need it to be. And then you stay in agreement with that person. You love that person enough to say, this is how they, they need that job. And I have agreed that that door will open. And I, that's the way it is. And you fight for that. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to see quickly that if you go to 2 Corinthians 13, 1, every fact is established on the basis of two or three witnesses. Paul said, this is the third time I am coming to you. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And you say, that seems sort of off the wall. Well, he says, I've come three times, and every time I've said the same thing. If I, one of our young people, they happened to go off to Honor Academy. They came to me two years after they had returned from the Honor Academy and said, do you know what I appreciate most about your being pastor? And I said, no, I don't. And they said, you are so wise in who you allow to minister from the pulpit. And I said, that is an extraordinarily perceptive thing for a young person to say. How do you, how do you realize that? Because it's one of the biggest things I do. I've lost friends over who I will and will not allow to be in this pulpit. Why? Because if there's ever a wavering in what this comes across this pulpit, it will affect your faith. Okay? And they, they told me that, well, I, the church I was attending out there had somebody really off the wall in there, and it took them six months to try to get people set straight. You say, well, what are we saying here? When, every, when Mark Hankins comes, and he says, this is the holy world, all you all need is a little more joy than you've got, you know? He says, amen, amen to everything. You need to have the words coming across your kids' ears agree with the kingdom of God in, in, in a godly worldview. Amen? Amen? You need to have what you're listening to. I mean, I know you have to listen to a certain amount of Fox or CNN where you have no clue who's what or who had a vote. But if that's all you hear, it tampers with your image of God. There's others. Deuteronomy 17, 6. I just want you to understand the power of agreement. You're not supposed to listen to an accusation against an elder without two or three witnesses. Look here. In the Old Testament, they have the death penalty. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, he was to die, shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. And you say, what is, I understand I'm coming at this from a lot of different, but whenever two people say the same thing, it makes it stronger. That's why when you tell me I'm listening to Kenneth Copeland, I don't get mad. If you, t uh, you don't understand? I, you know, some people, they say, well, I show this. No, that's ridiculous. I listen to a whole lot of good faith preachers because with every confirming witness, my faith grows stronger. Amen. Hallelujah. Look at what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 5.19. It says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of truth and witness. Why? Because nothing is firm without confirming witnesses. Now I'll go to Matthew 18, 15. We're going to finish on this group of scripture. Does everybody see that if you can find somebody who really believes and loves you and come into agreement on something hard that you're praying about, not every single thing you pray about. Well, you run it, have you ever run into resistance on something and you're so wary of praying? I had, go, go to Matthew 18. 
Now you talked about my fate, one of my favorite prayer warriors was Adelda Gregoris. I called her my heavy hitter. I loved her dearly. She died at 92. She's this high and the devil was terrified of her, trust me. <laughs> I never went until there was one. I just couldn't get it. And I said, Adele, I gotta have your help. That lady would take it and worship God and she would get it, pray through every time. When you lose somebody like that to heaven, it's a hard day, I'll tell you. But God will always provide you. But have a Greer's, but be an agreer. Amen? Amen? Now, Matthew 18, 15. This is super important with how you deal with somebody that offends you at church. If your brother sins or offends you, go and show him his fault in private. And if he listens to you, you have won your brother. Now, the truth is, if you have an issue with anything in church, whether it's a scheduling issue, a rule change, or whatever. Oh, my, now we're going to touch it real quick. Okay, I would like to first of all say... That the hardest thing this church does is schedule anything because we have four to five times as much stuff scheduled as I think we should have scheduled. But God likes it all. I check. <laughs> we may not have upward next year unless someone rises. That is their one and only calling. It is all consuming the person that has to them. Okay. But overall, I think that what we're doing is what we're supposed to be doing. But what that means is that sometimes we step on each other's toes. Not meaning to, because it's hard to find enough hours in the week to schedule what we know God wants. Okay, so what do you do? The first thing you do if you have a scheduling problem is go to the person and explain why that was a bad idea. Because they didn't do it all on purpose. Now, I'm telling you from the scripture here, okay? Don't get mad at me. If your brother messes up, go and show him his fault in private see if you can work it out. If he does not listen... Then take one or two with you. Now, this is a more serious thing, what needs to be addressed. So that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, if you take one or two with you, how many will be there? Two or three. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, a fact will be established. If a person is sinning and refuses to repent when you meet with them individually, then you take along. You always protect the person's privacy to the very much you can. You're not out to hurt anybody. Okay? All right, does this make sense? If you got an issue with somebody, just go to them. Don't make me go to them every time. You know what I'm saying? I don't mind, but I sure am the bad guy when I have to talk to every. <laughs> if it's a little thing, just go. Because and I know most of the time we work it out. But this is the scriptural precedent. If he doesn't, then by the two or th by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact will be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to all three of you, two or three of you, then you tell it to the church, and if. He, refuses to listen to the church, then you treat him like an outsider. He'd be like a Gentile and tax collector, not part of the family of God. Then Jesus said, truly I say to you, and you understand that is the way we deal with issues. If you have an issue, you don't gossip. Amen. You go to the person. Amen. Truly I say to you, verse 18, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Why? Because you've been given authority. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. What kinds of things can we bind and loose? You have power to bind all demonic spirits. Lack, hostility, rejection, strife, malice, worldliness, ungodliness, immorality. All of those spirits you have authority over. Okay? Whatever you loose on earth, what can you loose? You can loose grace and mercy and acceptance and love and peace and joy on people. And you, for, and somebody, you can loose that into somebody's life. Now look at verse 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth, so you've got to be on earth, about anything that they may ask, that's huge. Now, I think it assumes that it's going to be godly and according to the will of God. All right? But anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. I mean, you can think about that a long time. My plans, ten till, was to pull two agreeers up. Okay, let's suppose you have two people agreeing. All right, Ben and Nathan, come on up. Just, just be my... All right. First of all, I've never asked anybody to agree with... I'll, I'll, get, I'll take that back. I did call Kenneth Copeland's ministries once, and they have heard. And that's all right. But if you're going to ask somebody to agree, usually there'll be somebody, you know, y'all know each other. We had lunch the other day, know each other. Do you like him okay? Do you like him okay? Yeah. <laughs> just trying to make a point. Just, now, do you know why we get such tremendous results from the prayer alert? Because of the intense love in this church. We have people from that side of Fredericksburg all the way down by Calio. 
when we are, our, our lake comes, he comes from down there by Hague or Kaleo. Okay, Kaleo, I can't say it. We have people saying, God, you got to heal Mr. Morgan. And boom, he does go through surgery and doesn't have any pain. All right. So, number one, y'all like each other. You haven't had any tips at all. You're, okay, we're good. You care about him? His will be. You care about his will be. Then you qualify. Then the next question is, you could be from another denomination. I couldn't ask you. Now listen, I'm telling you, you can't. I'm not putting them down. They don't believe it. You got to find somebody that believes that God said and meant exactly what He meant. Right. So do you believe God really wants to bless him and his his family? Okay. I'm just making a point here. I just yeah. me and hey, at least I held your attention for two more minutes. I was about ready to lose it. <laughs> what would you like him to agree on? Can you come up with something for an example? Uh, yeah, I'd like uh, Nathan to agree on uh, on a house for my family. Is that something you think is godly? You, are, could you get excited about that? Do you have? No, I'm serious. If you don't care, you're no lousy agreeer. Could you get excited to see his family of five beautiful children in a neat house? Okay, then you just, okay, grab hands. Just, I want you to understand the power in this. Not all hands. Take the right hand like you're going to shake hands. Thank you. Now pray. I want you to understand that. Because we say, oh, no big deal. Big deal on the devil's side. Because the moment they agree on it, could you ask God for the perfect house and mean it? Just go ahead. He means it. We'll agree with you, too. Oh, okay. And this mayor, I would pray that the blessing be on the family and that he bless them in the right house at the right time with the perfect, the right location. Cheaper than they thought. Cheaper than the move. Amen. 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 Now, just one more minute. What's going to happen when the devil says, you know you can't afford a decent house? I'm going to agree with Nathan. Amen. Um, what is going to happen when you say they, uh, they they probably have not handled their fine, and I know you're handling your fine. I'm just saying, the devil will tell the agreeer, and no, they probably might not have handled their finance good enough to fall by the low. You, I'm not saying you haven't, but you understand the devil is going to attack his mind. Are you willing to say, I am in agreement with them for the perfect house? Uh, I, I know you handle finance as well. I didn't mean to insult you. I'm trying to accuse it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm getting a house. I want you to say that. I'm serious. Yes, 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 yes. I've seen it so many times. And I'm just saying, take the prayer of agreement seriously. Be a good agreer. Every time the enemy says, it's been two months and they don't have that house, he says, they will have the perfect house. That's a man of agreement. Isn't that wonderful? How many of you can be a, a you can sit down. I'm sorry. Thank you. You were a home. thought was just kind of a nice little ritual is actually so powerful in the spirit and the only thing that you have to agree on is something that's not actually written that's what I had tonight I see it more clearly than I've ever seen it and I'm excited about it this is we haven't done this in a long time we're going to break up in groups of three to four people I ask you to get in a group with somebody you didn't ride to church with so you get to meet somebody new okay and then if you've got something that's not too private to share say agree with me on this does everybody see this is powerful Okay. And I used to teach seventh grade, and if you don't get in groups, I don't think we can get in groups. I would say that. 